the call to worship. <clears throat> o Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them, mortals that you care for them? Yet you have made them a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. Rock of Israel and cornerstone of our common life, you are not bound by our visions, our structures, our doctrine. We cannot predict your coming and going Yet you have given us your story, your family, your work to do. Meet us here. Shape us for service in your world, for we carry the name of Jesus and live by the power of your breath. Amen. You may be seated. Sisters and brothers, all are who led by the Spirit of God are children of God. We did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but we have received a spirit of adoption. Let us then confess our sin with the freedom of children who know how deeply they are loved. Will you please join with me in our prayer of confession? Merciful God, your creatures cry, creation groans, but we turn away. We surround ourselves with noise. We are quick to excuse ourselves from responsibility. We are young, we are old, we are tired, we are busy, and are hard to imagine that we might make a difference. Life-giving God, wash us clean. Restore our imaginations and our hearts. Let your courage and compassion flow through our veins until we love with abandon and our hands reach out in blessing. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. Amen. Sisters and brothers, hear the word of the Lord. In the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, God says unequivocally, irrevocably, you are my own, you are forgiven, and I need you to be about my business in this world. God blesses us that we might carry that blessing into the world. Let us give with grateful hearts. Please stand for the doxology. mystery and grace, you have met us and blessed us with such abundant promise. In gratitude, we offer what we carry in our hearts and our pockets. As we bring these worn and freighted offerings, we pray that you would use us, for we come in the name of Jesus and by the movement of your spirit in this place. Amen. Please be seated. This is our time of joys and concerns.
I'm, she'll be fine, but she's having her gallbladder taken out and she's having a soap down her esophagus. So, Lord of your mercy. And then I'm asking for traveling mercies for my oldest daughter, if we have Linda, we come back from Little Rock, Arkansas. They're down there with our great granddaughter and granddaughter. And um, traveling mercies for us because we're
just, she called me and I'm like, no way. Yeah, that's the best, no way. Yeah. <laughs> so, just, just, yeah, like, yeah, just a short little story. <laughs> The prayer of illumination. Holy One, you love with a father's tenderness, a mother's zeal. Move, move now in our hearts. Breathe through the words we hear, the songs we share, the burdens we carry, until we discover our purpose in your liberating love. For we long to join creation's praise and to shine with the mercy of the Christ in whose name we pray, amen. The New Testament reading is Romans 8, 12 through 25. So then, brothers and sisters, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If in fact we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. I consider that suffering that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits for eager longing for the re revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to fertility, not of its own, will but by the will of the one who sub subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now and not only the creation but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. The first song of the hymn sing is Nearer My God to Thee, 528.
Next Jensen is 206. I want to walk as a child of the life. My goodness, that is cool. Also throws you a bit of a curve, you know? Anyway. Yeah, it took us a few verses. <laughs> to, to, catch, to catch that one, yeah, I'll just pause and then clink. <laughs> anyway, so our gospel reading this morning is from Matthew. Chapter 13, verses 24 through 30, and 36 through 43. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like someone who planted good seed in his field. While people were sleeping, an enemy came and planted weeds among the wheat and went away. When the stalk sprouted and bore grain, then the seed weeds also appeared. The servants of the landlord came and said to him, Master, didn't you plant good seed in your field? Then how is it that it has weeds? An enemy has done this, he answered. The servant said to him, Do you want us to go and gather them? But the landlord said, No, because if you gather the weeds, you'll pull up the wheat along with them. Let's both grow si let both grow side by side until the harvest. Then at harvest time, I'll say to the harvesters, First gather the weeds and tie them together in bundles to be burned but bring the wheat into my barn. Jesus left the crowds and went into the house. His disciples came to him and said, explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. Jesus replied, the one who plants the good seed is the human one. The field is the world and the good seeds are the followers of the kingdom. But the weeds are the followers of the evil one. 
The enemy who planted them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the present age. The harvesters are the angels. Just as people gather weeds and burn them in the fire, so it will be at the end of the present age. The human one will send his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that cause people to fall away and all people who sin. He will throw them into a burning furnace. People there will be weeping and gnashing their teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in their Father's kingdom. Those who have ears should hear. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So a storyteller usually has one thing to communicate, one main point to make when he or she tells a good story. Jesus is a good storyteller. That's the one thing we get pretty much Sunday after Sunday are stories. The kingdom of God is like, and Jesus tells the story. We also have with the story, might be some other little sidelines and different things that go different directions, but there's one major point for each story. One of the parts of the story that immediately catches our attention in the, is the enemy or the devil, as Jesus refers to his explanation. It would be easy to let this revelation take us to a discussion on the personal nature of the enemy of our souls and all. You know, it's, uh, I have to say, I rarely heard about the devil or evil when I was a young man in a mainline uh, Christian church. We didn't talk about that. Matter of fact, we didn't often talk about sin. Well, as I've gotten older, I got a different understanding of some of those things and probably even have a few stories that would tell you exactly what I my in my own journey, you know. Another element would uh, easily capture our attention is the reality of the judgment at the end of time. Do you ever think about that? The end of time? Is it the end of our lives or is it some historical thing that's way out there? Hard to say how that plays out. So what's the point in this story today? Jesus began, the kingdom of heaven is like. This is a clue. It's going to be a story about kingdom, the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. These are two terms that are used pretty much interchangeably. They're, it is talking about something much greater than ourselves where God is the one who rules the lives and souls and hearts of all of God's followers, you know? I talk about it fairly often, I hope, as I preach and as I do my own journey. The way the farmer sowed the wheat could not have uh, surprised his listeners. That's kind of a fascinating thing. I, I think, uh, do we, do we worry about whether people are going to come and kind of wreck our field when, after we've gotten it all planted? Because that's what this is about, you know. This story is about someone coming and putting weeds in the midst of this field that is ready for growing and ready for it to do what nature does. Last week we... Uh, we had another story about sowing with the different conditions that we sowed under, you remember? This time it's about that harvest that comes forth. So I found it interesting as I was working with this that in fact there are laws in some parts of the world against people basically destroying someone else's crop out of a sense of vindictiveness. Could that be? that there would be people so angry and so upset and whatever that they would wish to take another farmer and wreck that harvest or wreck that field. I don't know. It would seem. It would seem that there it does. So most of the crowd of that day would also have been familiar with the weeds that Jesus was talking about in this story. That was a part of history at that time, and I understand there are still laws on books in other parts of the world dealing with this very subject. India is one of them. 
So we have the wheat and the weeds. In the King James Version of the Bible, the weeds, the term that they use are tares, the tares, T-A-R-E-S. The wheat and the tares, the wheat and the tares, you know? The good and the not so good. So, who can deny the reality of evil in this world? Because that is a part of what this story is about. It's about the good and the evil, the broken, the bad, the sin, the whatever, you know? We see it in nations, fighting nations. I, I think we see what's happening in Ukraine and that part of the world. And I think, you know, here we are, what we're well over a year into this war that's happening over there. It's still a part of our news. Part of our news because I think for many of us in America, that part of the world is where our ancestors came from. We have some roots in that part of the world. Might not have been Ukraine specifically, but we're in, you know, many of us came from that European countries. So it it's kind of stands out more for us. So we can also see evil in this brokenness in the uh, starving children that we see every now and then in the news or those Horrible things that happen, especially to children in urban areas. Well, not always in urban areas. It happens, can happen everywhere. We read in the newspaper about another murder. That's almost a daily occurrence in some places. I find, still find that the mass killings that have become almost commonplace what a horrible thing. You know, this is evil that is confronts us. You know, if we get a diagnosis of cancer or other life-changing or life-threatening health issues, we're confronted with something pretty powerful and pretty negative. So we may doubt the source, but we can never doubt the reality of this darkness that we would call evil or the devil, or whatever. However we want to personify or bring it to, to show the, the power of, this, of the negative. So evil is real in the struggles of humanity, and it is real in the struggles within the church. Anybody want to challenge that statement? You know, I'm comfortable for all of us, every single one, if you're to journey in this path that the Lord invites us in, he says, follow me. And as you begin to follow the Lord of life, you're going to find within the body of Christ, the church, you're going to find things that happen that are very disturbing and upsetting. Things that we might call evil or brokenness or sin. Use your own term. But if you're going to journey and draw closer to the Lord of life, you will see that, those circumstances, and you're gonna to have to grow through them to the other side, you know? And those are not, not at all good news. So, if we will, the wheat and the tares, they're just a part of the mix, wherever you are, whether it's in the world out there, whether it's in your own personal life, whether it's in the church, wherever, that brokenness is a part of the journey. Then we uh, come to the compelling response of the servants of this story. Now that's interesting. Here they are. What do they want to do? They want to go out and they want to uproot it. They just want to grab the weeds and pull them right out before they take any better, any bigger root than they have, right? Well, there are some issues with that. And the master discourages them from doing that. First of all, to have the discernment of which are weeds and which are wheat may be a whole lot more discernment required than we are able to, more wisdom as we look at the bigger issues of life, you know? So he says, let them grow. Let them grow and together at the end, We'll separate out what is wheat and what is weeds. 
Separate them out at the end, not at the beginning. How many issues in our lives, how many issues in our lives are like that? You know, there are things that we deal, deal with in our regular everyday life, in our living, in our personal lives, that on the one hand can be both good, but it has the potential to be, well, bad. Alcohol. Alcohol is one of those. You know, Jesus, Jesus caused a real stir among those good, righteous, religious leaders because he drank with ordinary people. He liked to socialize and, you know, let's be honest, I think the guy partied a fair amount. So is that bad? Well, not necessarily, but it has the potential, the very real potential to become quite bad. You know, I've stood up here on so many occasions, you know my story, my name is Bob. So, and I've known a whole lot of folks, a whole lot of folks that sit in the church that came to that juncture in their life where they had to say what I said one day 30 some years ago, if I don't quit drinking, if I don't quit drinking, I will never be able to quit drinking and I don't want to go down that path any further than I've already gone, than I've already gone. Lots of people in that situation. You know, there are others. Gambling, gaming, we call it. We have a new name. Have, have you noticed how our culture takes the things that have the potential for real damage and brokenness, and we put some other little polish on it so that we can live in denial, honestly, of the damage that is very real and potential. I guess that gaming, can be fun and relaxing, and it's a social way of spending time, ta da 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 It is until you start wasting your paycheck that the family desperately needs. How many other issues can come out of? I remember uh, one of the wealthy people in the Decatur area said when uh, Decatur was, ne uh, was negotiating, if you will, over whether they would have uh, legalized uh, gaming in town. He said that that was uh, that was voluntary taxation. Well now that's really finding a positive spin on something that can be quite destructive. You know he was quite happy to call it voluntary taxation because if those poor folks over there squandered their money on this he wouldn't have to pay his money in taxation to support the government and the other issues. You get the idea. So, and then we have this thing we call money. Money, money, money. Boy, if there was ever a God in our culture, money is the God of our culture. There is no doubt. I, uh, I take a, save, a saying that uh, Vince Lombardi, and I kind of, I put a little different spin on it, you know. Money isn't everything, it's the only thing in our culture. And pretty much that really is true. It drives everything. Is it good? Absolutely. Can it do good? Absolutely. The potential is there for greatness. But if it drives this team off the edge of the cliff out of a sense of greed, it is very destructive. You know it, we all know it. You can't deny it. The second reason that Christ has not called us to uproot the tares is given to us in the story itself. It will damage the wheat. You know, it's not, it's kind of something I'm kind of fond of saying to young people that I know. It's not how you start the race of life that counts, it's how you finish the race of life, you know? We all start off with a mix. We all start off with, well, we just, 
We have good and we have not so good. We have issues as we grow and as we mature. It's how you finish the race of life. Which one wins out? Is it being able to love your neighbor as yourself, to be able to love others, to be able to give sacrificially to those who are in need, to respect, to learn to be a citizen of the kingdom of God? Or do we remain self-centered and focused only upon ourselves? You know, that's the difference. That's the difference. How the Lord works through us and we allow that to happen. There's a neat story I'd like to share. It's about an old Hasidic tale about three pious Jews who decided to travel to a distant city to spend the high holy days with a famous rabbi. They were on a pilgrimage. So they set out on their journey without any money or food, intending to walk the entire way. Several days into the journey, weak from hunger and still a long way from their destination, they knew they had made a mistake and they must do something different. They came up with a plan. They decided that one of them would disguise himself as a rabbi. That way, when they came to the next village, the people would offer them food, honored to have a rabbi visit their town. None of the three, being pious, wished to be the deceitful one. So they drew straws, and the unlucky one who drew the short straw had to don the clothing of the rabbi and another dressed as his assistant. And when the meal was done, they went and found someone to offer them, just as they'd planned. When the meal was done, however, the innkeeper approached and said, Rabbi, Rabbi, you must pray for my son, he said. He is dying and the doctors have given up hope. But the Holy One, blessed by his name, may respond to your prayers. The counterfeit rabbi looked desperately to his friends for help. They motioned for him to go into the innkeeper or to the son's bedside. They began this hypocritical ruse, and now there was no choice but to keep on playing the game. The mock rabbi accompanied the distraught father to his son's sickbed. That night, the three travelers slept fitfully. They were eager to leave town before their deception was discovered. In the morning, the innkeeper, still hoping for a miracle and grateful for the prayer of his visiting rabbi, sent them off with the loan of a carriage and a team of horses. He'd done, the innkeeper had done his part for sure. They left the village and traveled to the great city where they spent magnificent holy days under the spell of this famous rabbi. His, his teaching of the Torah carried their spirits to the very vault of heaven. But too soon the holy days were at an end and the three companions had to go back home through the same village to return the borrowed carriage. Terrified, the mock rabbi resumed his disguise. His heart was in his throat as they approached the village, especially when he saw the innkeeper running toward them, waving his arm furiously. But in a pretender's delight and surprise, the innkeeper embraced him with joy, claiming, thank you, Rabbi. Only one hour after you left our village, my son arose from his bed, we and strong. The doctors are amazed, but my son lives, and I'm grateful for your faithful prayer. The two champions, companions, the two companions looked with astonishment at their phony rabbi companion. What had happened? Has his prayer healed the boy? Was he truly a rabbi all along without telling them? When they were alone, they turned on him with their questions. What had he done at that boy's deathbed? They demanded to know. He replied that he had stood at the boy's side in silence and then began to lift his thoughts to heaven. Master of the universe, please 
This father and son should not be punished just because they think I'm a rabbi. Who am I? I am nothing, a pretender. If this child dies, his father will think a rabbi can do nothing. So master of the universe, not because of me, but because of this father and his faith, can it hurt that his son would be healed? And he was healed. We're all a mixture, in all honesty, of the wheat and the tares. Each of us, you know? And the Lord, the Lord invites us as citizens of his kingdom to be who we are and to allow his spirit to work through us with all of our brokenness, with all of our, with all of just who we are as mortals. Jesus says, follow me, follow me, and allow his spirit to work through us. Praise be his holy name. Amen. My friends, would you please join with me in our closing hymn, which is Love Divine, All Loves Excelling, number 384.